So the first session that we have up today is um, in relation to feedstock, which for anybody who's been working in the bioenergy space, uh, this is a constant uh, topic of conversation. Uh, we have some fantastic speakers, um, and it's really fantastic for us at Bioenergy Australia that we have seen a significant expansion in our membership from this cohort, um, this sector, and that the feedstock sort of supply area is really starting to become far more engaged in the bioenergy opportunity, and particularly relating to renewable gas and renewable liquid fuels. So I am delighted to introduce Joe O'Neill from the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, who is sponsoring this session. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, thank you, Shahana, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, there we go. Uh, look, in a net zero world, uh, bio and renewable fuels will play a critical role in the decarbonisation journey. Uh, from an Australian perspective, and you all heard it all ad nauseum yesterday, uh, you know, and I don't want to labour the point, uh, renewable fuels will be key to the decarbonisation of our transport sector and uh, to every other subsector that it touches, such as aviation and marine, uh, and as well as our tourism. Uh, uh, sector and resources sector. In today's later sessions, you are likely to hear that uh, renewable gases like biomethane uh, are going to be vital in decarbonising Australia's gas network and our industrial sector, and that anaerobic digestion, uh, as its key technology pathway, will be a tool in the decarbonisation of our waste sector and water, uh, water utilities as well. Countries like Australia, with its large biogenic uh, and renewable resources, should be well positioned. Uh, to, to benefit from the transition from fossil fuels to renewable fuels, both from an economic and decarbonisation perspective. However, the path is forward is not laid out for us. A significant driver of whether we will able, uh, be able to make the most of that transition and take full advantage of it will be dependent on whether we can take advantage of the feedstock opportunities that we have today and how much we can shape future feedstock, uh, the future feedstock landscape in the country. In a moment, we will hear from our distinguished uh, panel of speakers uh, who are going to help frame that, that current opportunity in that future landscape uh, with a particular focus on liquid biofuels. But first, I'll give you a quick high-level overview of the, uh, the CEFC. We're often described as the Australian Federal Government's Green Investment Bank, uh, and for the last 12 years, we have been uh, investing our original $10 billion capital allocation uh, in solely or mainly Australian-based decarbonisation projects. This slide tells the story of what we, we've been able to achieve with that initial $10 billion. In short, uh, I draw your attention to the almost $13 billion in lifetime commitments. Uh, we've deployed in excess of our original $10 billion capital allocation, and we've supported almost $50 billion of transaction value uh, and catalyzed almost $3 of private sector investment for every dollar of, of CFC invested uh, capital. We've been able to deploy over and above our original capital allocation because we operate much like an open-ended fund uh, in that when we receive cash flows from our, back from our investments, be that uh, you know, return of capital or, or dividends and the like, we're able to recycle and reinvest that capital uh, into, into eligible investments for us, which you can sort of see broadly uh, depicted here alongside our current active deployment numbers. CFC's successful track record in the clean energy uh, rollout has meant that we've recently been allocated uh, an additional $20.5 billion. And while those funds have been um, you know, bookmarked for specific initiatives, most notably the $19 billion for the Rewiring the Nation initiative, it means there's effectively less competition uh, for those funds from within our initial $10 billion capital allocation. So it really is good news for decarbonisation projects across the board. Uh, but enough about us and on to the feedstock. Now, this is a simplistic overview of, of the sort of feedstocks associated with the most commonly discussed uh, renewable liquid fuels technologies with a clear bias for ASTM, uh, all of which I've, I'm sure you heard about uh, discussed at length yesterday. Um, and noting the pivot in today's later sessions uh, to focus on renewable gases, I've also included uh, biomethane and its primary technology pathway anaerobic digestion over there on the right as well. Diving into this feedstock discussion, uh, I'm, I'm about to make some sweeping generalisations, so it'll probably ruffle some feathers, but uh, as long as I ruffle everyone's equally, I'm sure it'll be okay. Um, I think the key takeaways here are, you know, from a commercial and technology risk perspective, as Jimmy from, from Lands of Jet put it so eloquently yesterday, heifer is where it's at. Um, but it's also probably the most feedstock constrained technology in terms of both volume of feedstock available, scalability of that feedstock, and the variety of feedstocks that it can process, and they are all expensive. 
Alcohol to jet can make use of a wider array of, of less pressured feedstocks, and some of those feedstocks are feedstocks that Australia is probably very well placed to produce. Uh, and though it's not a commercial, uh, you know, the commercial readiness of, say, a heifer, it is showing progress, and I'm sure all of us will be very keenly watching uh, what uh, Freedom Pines uh, is, is progressing like in Jet Zero Australia's activities onshore as well. Like alcohol to jet, Fisher Tropes uh, shows a lot of promise in its ability to process a wide variety of feedstocks, uh, and one of its key advantages may indeed be its ability to process, you know, uh, more problematic feedstocks, the likes of, you know, MSW comes to mind. Uh, however, there have been some, some technological uh, and commercial hiccups to date, so from a, a technology risk perspective, it's probably lagging those other two. And though none of our speakers in this session will be doing a, a deep dive on it, our later panels will be discussing it, uh, you know, renewable gas and biomethane. I've always had a soft spot for uh, anaerobic digestion myself. I think it must be the lovely smell when I conduct site visits. Um, no one laughs, so you haven't been to a site visit on an AD, presumably. Um, but really it's, it's about the flexibility with AD and it's not just on the, the feedstock side which you can clearly see depicted there, it's the biogas that comes out uh, of those facilities and what it can be used for. It truly is a, a wonderful technology when it's done right and you know we also have the benefit of having seen it delivered uh, many many times overseas so from a technology risk perspective it's certainly um, you know in a, in a sort of world of its own amongst those others on the board there. Uh, without further ado, I'll skip over into introducing our, our panel. So we have Max Temminghoff from CSIRO, uh, Jeff Somerville from, from Grain Corp, Rachel Palumbo from New Seeds New Farm, uh, Alan Green from Agrinew, Anne Grobler from Microbiogen, and uh, last but not least, uh, David Rin from the Australian Sugar Milling Council. I think first up, it's uh, you, Max, and you're going to tell us all about our agricultural residues and technology opportunities. Thank you very much. It's quite a long runway. Um, I'm going to be touching on Australia's agricultural residues opportunities and the technology options of processing them. So this is a bit of a, um, uh, a cut out of our sustainable aviation fuel roadmap that came out in August last year. Um, and I'll just be again setting the scene. I'm sure you saw a lot of this yesterday, but just very quickly, the aviation industry is projected to increase its CO2 emissions through growth in passenger demand over the next several decades. So in the, since 1990, we have tripled our domestic aviation emissions and jet fuel demand is projected to increase by 75% through to 2050. And as you see there, it's going to be pretty heavily swayed towards international flights. And these are generally long haul flights that will require sustainable aviation fuel to decarbonise. A local SAF industry isn't just about decarbonising our airlines, and when it comes to agricultural residues, it's really this centre um, uh, opportunity here of regional jobs and development that is probably the largest one. So collecting and processing our agricultural residues will require positioning these facilities as close to the source as possible. So this will be in our regional areas, will require construction jobs, supply chain um, operations, as well as operating these plants. So it is certainly beyond sustainable aviation fuel. In our original study, we covered all of these feedstocks. I'm just gonna focus on the agricultural um, residues today. And we've chosen these feedstocks here because they did have commercial output at the time of our modeling and or uh, government backing in terms of projections of production. It's certainly not an exhaustive list of all the feedstocks that could be used things that our other panel members will be talking about today, such as non-edible seeds, carinata, pongamia, algae, um, and, and leaf oils are all gonna be very important going forward, and it's gonna be very exciting to see how they uh, progress over the coming years. But back to agricultural residues. So here's a cut of all of our feedstocks um, and shows that it's gonna be a real combination of feedstocks and technologies that's gonna get us to decarbonizing the aviation sector. What you can see there is that agricultural residues is certainly the largest opportunity. So we think that we're sitting on about enough uh, sustainable residues in 2025 for about three billion litres of SAF. That's not counting the renewable diesel and renewable LPG that will go with it, up to about four and a half billion um, litres by 2050. Although it is the largest uh, opportunity, we definitely see it as the highest hanging fruit on the tree. There's a lot of challenges that go with collecting it and processing it in an economic manner. So we'll get touching on them very briefly here. 
In terms of where these residues are, it very much aligns with agricultural output, so the southwest of Australia, the wheat belt there, as well as Victoria and New South Wales wheat belt, and we've got bagasse in Queensland, and then in Tasmania there's uh, some forestry residues that could be utilised. As I mentioned, the opportunity for um, SAF from agricultural residues is significant, but much work needs to be done to economically collect, aggregate and upgrade them. So some of the key considerations of using these as a feedstocks, first of all, is that collection and aggregation. Uh, bringing these to a centralised point is going to be very uneconomical. These are very uh, low energy dense materials, thinking of straw, hay. You can't have a centralised plant with hundreds of trucks arriving every day with the feedstock. It's not going to be economically viable and it's not going to be very sustainable running all those trucks, unless of course they are running on renewable diesel. In terms of crop residue balance, it's increasingly common practice to leave a lot of these agricultural residues on field to return nutrients to the soil and prevent soil erosion. But you do reach a point of diminishing returns and there's various literature out there. It does depend on your rainfall, but it's about 30 to 50 per cent that you want to leave on field for these more um, sustainable benefits. And so our modelling just looked at that remaining about 70 per cent of residues in high density areas and it's still a pretty large opportunity. Another key consideration is changing climate. You can see that fluctuating green, uh, blue line on the left there, which is historical residual production, which fluctuates pretty wildly. And of course, this is directly correlated with agricultural output, which is a result of the climate that year. So there is a lot of variation that we need to account for. And there are ways to offset this supply risk. So introducing additional supplementary feedstocks, so designing your plant, so perhaps on Monday it's agricultural residues, Tuesday it's municipal solid waste, and Wednesday it's forestry residues, is one way that we can counteract these unpredictable yields. But it's not recommended that you would run a, a large-scale plant solely on agricultural residues for those reasons. Another challenge is just the vast array of technologies available to upgrade agricultural residues and it's really going to be horses for courses when it comes to choosing one of these. So what are your local conditions, what are your local feedstocks look like, what are the distances you're travelling will help um, indicate what technologies you'll choose. So just quickly, pyrolysis and hydrothermal liquefaction, these are pretty mature at the moment and they produce these oils that can be co-processed today in our refineries up to about 5% blending it with a crude oil. So this is an opportunity to reduce the carbon intensity of our fuels today without any additional infrastructure. Gasification and FT was just touched on. It's a very capital intensive um, process and it's a very, very mature process. There's been billions of dollars put into R&D and there hasn't been much of a turn of the dial in terms of costs there. So it is um, pretty much what you get. What you see is what you get. Um, Talking about upgrading it to ethanol or methanol, it is an additional step, either catalytic conversion or syngas fermentation. Adding extra processing steps usually adds extra costs, e extra energy requirements. So again, it's going to be a very specific use case that's going to utilise that pathway. And then finally, um, enzymatic hydrolysis or advanced fermentation, so directly producing ethanol. This is an option perhaps for a distributed model where you might have these plants situated um, at farm gates perhaps that can produce ethanol on site and then you can transport that ethanol to a centralised plant to reduce those transport costs. Just quickly in terms of costs, so again in the yellow there shows biomass through gasification and FT. You can see that there's not much of a decrease over time because this is a very mature technology and it's going to depend um, pretty much on the price that you get your biomass for. Similar for ethanol in that black colour there, you know, that this is assuming a halving of the price of ethanol through advanced fermentation processes and it is very dependent on the price that you get your ethanol for. So we'll be watching closely how we can get those prices down. Just quickly on what CSIRO or CSIRO is doing at the moment across the uh, liquid fuel uh, supply chain. So we've got um, quite a number of power to liquid technologies that's using green hydrogen and direct air capture to produce liquid fuels. Importantly for this session in terms of feedstock production and processing we have a very large agricultural group who is looking at alternative seed types, how we can better collect agricultural residues. We have our energy group who has a long history in gasification. It's working with a number of companies at the moment to help them characterise what goes into the gasifier and what can come out and how we can optimise that syngas ratio to make upgrading into fuel a lot more efficient. 
We've also got our Toward Net Zero Mission. You might have met a couple of them last night, led by Warren Flengey, who is helping to facilitate these collaborations. And I'll be more than happy to introduce any of you to him to speak about how you can work with CSIRO. And then finally, our group in strategic advisory. So we're currently advising the Royal Australian Air Force on alternative fuel options. And we're also um, speaking quite widely about the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Roadmap, which came out last year. That's all I had for today. If you want more information, there's a link to the SAF roadmap or my contact details there. More than happy to speak with you or connect you to the right people at CSIRO who might be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you to Bioenergy Australia for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Jeff Somerville and I head up Grain Corp's agri-energy uh, business. I thought I'd just briefly start by what we do. So our part of Grain Corp's business is to provide uh, feedstocks to the global renewable fuel industry. Um, we're Australia and New Zealand's largest aggregator of tallow. We're one of two national UCO collectors and we have significant crush capability in Australia. Um, we celebrated being in tallow for 100 years last year and in used cooking oil for 50 years um, uh, in 2022. And we've been exporting feedstocks to the global renewable fuel business for 14 years. So whilst a lot of what we've spoken about in the last two days is new for Australia and our industries, it's something that we've been doing for an extended period of time. Uh, in terms of technology, we've spoken about a lot of it yesterday. Um, Grain Corp's position is that we are agnostic to the technology. Um, we have the capability to put feedstocks into all of the various different types of technologies, um, whether it's highly refined fats and oils for co-processing, whether it's tallow used cooking oil, canola, or increasingly novel crops into the uh, drop-in sustainable fuels, or the type of uh, elements for alcohol to jet in terms of sorghum and cereal, we uh, were able to fulfil the needs of all of those elements. However, we do think to move at scale and speed, um, drop-in fuels, the heifer technology is how we make a difference today. Um, I think some of the technologies and some of the feedstocks are wonderful. How do we uh, solve the problem for today so that we start decarbonising and then move into the future. So our focus in particular is on supporting the heifer technology for now. We've spoken a lot about demand and we concur with what was uh, said yesterday. Um, demand for SAF and renewable diesel is strong and one important element is how do we send that signal back to the Australian farming community of what feedstocks are required so that farmers can start to uh, develop those feedstocks that the world is asking for. And we think that um, that demand signal back to farmers is an important one to be able to develop those feedstocks that we need to get to the gap between what demand is and what supply is in a feedstock space. Um, the slide really just shows the different types of technology and the different types of feedstock and where Australia can play a role in that. Um, tallow and used cooking oil, wastes and residues are a fantastic uh, feedstock source, but they are to an extent finite. Um, used cooking oil is a function of population and to an extent a, a function of uh, the eating habits. Australia has a limited population. We generally eat healthier than other uh, worlds where deep frying is not that, uh, not that prevalent in Australia, so hence, Whilst it's a great feedstock, it is finite. Tallow is a function of herd size. The Australian herd is generally um, quite mature. And with the move towards um, poultry being the main protein source, we're seeing that as being capped out as well. So we think some of the opportunities start to look to crop-based oils. Um, we think canola has a really important role to play. Canola is mostly exported uh, in terms of Australia. We have an exportable surplus, so canola seed is exported both out of the east coast and west coast of Australia. And therefore, if we have the capability to bring that processing on shore, we think there's a real opportunity to move canola into a viable feedstock for an Australian SAF value chain. And the work we're doing with uh, 
IFM is helping to develop and work that out. I thought I'd just take a moment for what the Corsair um, CI intensity for uh, canola or rapeseed looks like. This is uh, the global numbers, so you can see on the left hand side canola is 73.4 and you can see two elements. Um, a lot of that comes from the actual feedstock itself. Now these are based on farming practices across the world. They are not specific to Australia and we think there is a real opportunity to um, work with uh, the likes of CSRO to work out what the Australian feedstock CI number is. That should bring down this overall CI of canola seed and make it a more uh, viable and important feedstock. So not only do we have the capability of adding to the feedstock balance sheet by starting first stage processing and using canola in Australia, we also have the capability of moving it to a lower CI um, type of feedstock. And I think you'll also see the, the indirect land use uh, change element and I think when Rachel speaks you'll hear some of that uh, element of what can come through in novel crops. Um, for Grain Corp we think novel crops is a really interesting pivot point going into the future. How do we look to develop crops that are grown for fuel on marginal land? Um, we're doing some work on what that might look like, how do we engage with our farmers in terms of building that capability, um, but again, how do we solve for today while looking to the future? And that's why we see a balance of both the traditional wastes and, and residues, canola oil and increasingly to novel crops. I just, we spoke a lot about regulatory uh, and, and government support and what's needed yesterday. Um, we concur that there's the US and the European example gives us two types of approaches that we can look at. The US is uh, more the carrot, as it was described yesterday. EU is more the stick. Um, the US has a revenue stack made up of tax credits, um, effectively carbon credits through the RINs network and state-based low carbon fuel standards. Uh, it's been an interesting way to start. They started on volume and move to more CI and GHG based approaches and that's we think a scientific way to reward those feedstocks that have lower CI so that they can play a bigger part in the overall feedstock mix. Um, Europe is mandated uh, and it's a very principled approach for example Europe has put a cap on vegetable oils and how much vegetable oil can be used in Europe. Um, part of the issue is that is that Europe has then used a lot of used cooking oil um, and some of the traceability of that used cooking oil has been um, problematic for, for that state. Um, in Australia, we are held to account by the end markets that we go to. The US EPA is uh, quite stringent on what needs to be done. And when I heard yesterday about what customers are looking for and transparency and traceability, for example, with our used cooking oil, we can trace it back to the restaurant or the shop that it was collected from. So that's really good traceability and gives, I think, end users comfort that the feedstock is from the right source. The same with tallow and we also were working that on canola as well. Um, I really wanted to move reasonably quickly today because I think the interest part of this session is going to be the questions from the audience. So I'm really looking forward to the audience <coughs> questions and participations at the end. But in terms of what we see, um, the benefits of an Australian SAF value chain and why we're working with IFM to develop one is really consistent with what we've heard over the last few days. But in terms of agriculture, I'd like to point out two things, and Max pointed to one of them. Um, it's really good for farmers and regional and rural communities. We see a great chance for our farmers to have a new demand source in fuel. Uh, we think that gives farmers and farming communities a great ability to diversify away from what we traditionally do. Um, and Australian farmers are very good at what they do. We are a land of droughts and flooding rains, and therefore we have to be uh, really efficient at what we do. So we think the emergence of carbon as a quality characteristic will start to reward growers for doing the right thing. And we think from there that will develop even lower CI feedstock. So we see a bit of circularity, um, getting those farmers to be uh, focused on carbon, to have efficient practices. Uh, and then as the industry in Australia develops, the renewable diesel and those sort of things can go back into the system a little bit like New South Wales DPI mentioned yesterday. Um, 
So that's really uh, what we see the benefits. For Grain Corp, what do we need to do? What's our 50%? Uh, we see the need to expand onshore crushing in Australia. We need to take uh, that raw seed that gets exported to overseas countries for fuel to really then um, be able to develop it up as a feedstock for the Australian uh, SAF industry. Um, we also think we need some consistency in accreditation. Um, as we showed in terms of what canola could look like, uh, we think there's an opportunity to work with the CSIRO to get a whole of industry approach to what that value chain looks like so that we can engage Corsair for all of Australian farmers to make canola, for example, a good feedstock. And you know, we think we then can pivot, as I said, into novel crops uh, down the track. So thank you very much for your time and I look forward to questions at the end. to lower this like uh, yesterday I'm a bit shorter than most of the other panellists so it's my uh, pleasure to be here with you all today and uh, I'm really excited to discuss the prospects of the local renewable fuels industry particularly being a large agricultural company. After briefly introducing who New Farm and New Seed are I wanted to take us through three key topics. So firstly, the emerging opportunity for Aussie farmers to be a part of this, to both drive and benefit from a thriving renewable fuels industry. Secondly, the role that oil seeds can play in this. And thirdly, the, the narrow window of opportunity that we have to really catalyse the development of a local renewable, new, local renewable fuels industry. So who is New Seed and who is New Farm? So New Seed is New Farm's seed technology platform and we are really focused on solving global challenges using plant science. So since 2006, New Seed's really been at the forefront of oilseed innovation globally and supporting both sustainable food and biofuel production around the world. Horsham in regional Victoria is the home to our New Seed Innovation Centre and really a, a strong heartbeat of the Australian canola industry. The 2013 opening of our New Seed Innovation Centre really accelerated the local development of canola, canola varieties that are suited specifically to conditions for Australian farmers. This investment has really export, um, ex, um, supported the expansion of the local Australian canola industry and today uh, canola is the second most valuable crop to the Australian grains industry. With one in every uh, two hectares planted to new seed genetics, our uh, little innovation centre in Horsham contributed $2.5 billion in farm gate value in the 22-23 season. And we're particularly proud of the team that we have there, over 300 years of canola scientific experience and seven PhDs that drive significant innovation for the industry. So, an emerging opportunity for Aussie farmers, and Jeff started to explore this. We have a real commitment to agricultural innovation, and that it now extends for us to really decarbonising the liquid fuels that we're going to be reliant on as a uh, country for, for decades to come. And we believe that Australia's global competitive agricultural sector is well placed to produce the feedstocks essential to meeting this growing demand. We do realise that this opportunity uh, requires a better understanding of the role that Australian farmers can play and sustainable production of crop-based feedstocks for renewable fuels will help Australian farmers also lower their carbon emissions and support the decarbonisation of hard to abate sectors, as we've heard this week. We see Australian agriculture can be a key feedstock provider, particularly when you consider that today we're a well-established producer of food, feed, fibre and fuel for domestic and international markets, as we've heard. And we do need to recognise that Aussie farmers are already providing a significant volume of feedstocks to support the decarbonisation of transportation in Europe. 
Most of the canola in Western Australia, and, and as we heard, is, is exported to Europe and is converted into biofuels thanks to the incentives that those markets have. Secondly, we know that Australia has the natural resources and the ag capability, given how leading our farmers are, to meet the growing demand for renewable feedstocks without displacing food or contributing to land use changes. So addressing our in energy transition challenges should not compromise our food security or our environment from our perspective. We see that oilseed innovation and crop management practices together underpinned by very clear sustainability standards and certification systems will enable increased crop-based feedstock production that supports both food and fuel security and greater utilisation of our local feedstocks for renewable fuel production can actually support our ag decarbonisation through the increased removal and storage of carbon and production of biodiesel for farm machinery. I now want to share a little bit about how our crop innovation and our global partnership with BP will contribute to the production of lower carbon fuels and strengthen farmers' sustainability, productivity and resilience. There's emerging solutions such as new seed carinata, which you've heard mentioned today, but some of you may not know what that is. And it's a, it's a brassica species, it's similar to canola, and it will enable our farmers to meet this rapidly uh, growing demand for feedstocks while also improving their productivity and sustainability. And so these advances in seed technology are actually having a significant uh, um, shift in the market and enabling us to have value chain collaboration to develop new markets and unlock new opportunities for Aussie farmers. So new seed carinata is a non-food oil seed. It's a cover crop and it's contract grown between main crop rotations. It's harvested, it's then crushed into an independently certified sustainable lower carbon oil feedstock and it does not compete with food or contribute to land use change. It's grown under contract as a cover or break crop and can grow on degraded land. I'm now gonna show a short video. New seed carinata oil is scalable and we're working in a global partnership with BP in, to support the scale up of this carinata production and processing into renewable fuel for end users. Um, we're expanding carinata plantings all over the world. This morning I was talking to my colleagues in Argentina, Brazil, Europe and the United States and we're about to undertake our first commercial plantings in Europe and Brazil and today carinata oil is being used overseas in production of biofuels on a small scale. The development of new seed carinata in Australia is underway and we're really focused on finding the right fit within the Australian agricultural landscape and we're planning to undertake commercial trials this year to determine the potential fit in the cotton system. We see there could be an opportunity as a break crop which not only provides a financial opportunity for Aussie cotton growers, but also helps them solve potential soil disease issues as uh, the carinata will have soil health benefits for them. So the new seed carinata crop, cover crop approach to carbon mitigation is really threefold. We see it, it, it reduces emissions used to replace fossil fuels, it removes atmospheric carbon from the environment as it grows, and it restore, restores soil carbon through its very extensive root system. It also protects soil from erosion and nutrient loss, 
Um, it increases below and above ground biomass at, to help us regenerate the soil and it support, supports biodiversity through increasing pollinator habitat and diversity. As with all biogenic sources, uh, Carinata removes atmospheric carbon as it grows. And because the carbon that is released upon combustion of end use fuels is equivalent to that captured throughout the growth, growth cycle, harvested feedstock is considered to be a carbon neutral source of energy. Ultimately, we understand that our Carinata program must really deliver agronomic and economic uh, value for Aussie farmers. And that's what our New Set Australia team is really focused on. How do we help farmers diversify their incomes and deliver productivity benefits to their main cash crops? So in the example of Carinata within the cotton system, we believe it'll deliver subsequent benefits to the following cotton crop. We have a uh, window of opportunity and we believe that enabling a local renewable fuels industry will support the resilience, sustainability and commercial strength of our Australian farmers and our Australian agricultural industry. But we have the opportunity to act pretty quickly now to, to try and influence the incentivising of supply and demand uh, as other countries have. The Albanese government has strengthened Australia's response to climate change through legislated emission reduction targets, reforming the safeguard mechanism, progressing the aviation green paper and the formation of the Jet Zero Council, as we've heard this week. And we're pleased to see that Minister Bowen's latest annual climate change statement highlighted the potential role of low carbon liquid fuels to strengthen the Australian energy security and create good jobs. Australia really needs policies to accelerate the development of local renewable fuel industry, as we've heard, and support the decarbonisation of hard to abate sectors. And we have a, a real narrow window of opportunity to, to get this done. And so from uh, the New Farm Group's perspective, we see four areas that policy settings should address. And the first is that policy settings should foster a market-based and technology neutral environment to attract investment. The second priority is to ensure Australia has globally aligned standards and certification schemes to ensure we remain internationally competitive. The third priority is to quickly build local demand for renewable fuels so that our Australian farmers have a well-functioning local market to sell their feedstocks. And finally, to build confidence in Australian production, being able to meet any mandated demand the government should really consider bridging part of the production cost difference between SAF and conventional jet fuel through contracts for difference. We see there's an intensifying squeeze on feedstock demand and we understand that there's going to be increasing competition for investment. And so again, acting with this sense of urgency will ensure that Aussie farmers have an opportunity to meet the demand, strengthen our food and fuel security, and create jobs in rural and regional Australia. New Farms' partnership with BP really demonstrates our commitment to unlocking these emerging opportunities, not only in Australia, but globally. I really want to thank you for your time and I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you today and to also share the, the agricultural voice. Thank you. a long walk over here. I thought of taking up Shahana's challenge and maybe doing a moonwalk, but I wasn't sure if there's any first aid available, so we won't do that. Um, by way of background, um, I'm a post-retiree consultant. That's a pretty well-trodden path. Before I retired about five years ago, I spent uh, all of my research career in CSIRO, just down the other end of the lake here, working on developing new, new oil crops and plant oil technologies. And since retiring, I've been continuing the uh, technology transfer aspects of that work and providing scientific advisory services to companies interested in innovating in this space. So from that perspective, um, or from that background, I think I bring a different perspective to um, what we've been discussing in the last day or so. We've seen um, some 
uh, flatline graphs for the role of fats and oils feedstocks into the future. And aligned to that, we've seen some yesterday some flatline projections for the heifer process. Um, I'm much more positive about the contribution that fats and oils can make in the future through technology developments that are already happening or are in the pipeline. And I think it can take us much deeper into the transition we need to make than, uh, than you may be aware of. So my task today really is to, uh, and I'm not really able to focus on that very well, um, so apologies for looking away from you. Um, how much of the uh, 30 million tonnes or so of diesel type fuels that we use in Australia could be replaced by biodiesel, renewable diesel or sap made from domestic oil crop feedstocks? And I have four opportunities that I'd like to present to you very quickly, obviously, uh, that I think can contribute to, to that. Um, and obviously we know that there's many pathways of going from plant material, be it the vegetative material or the oil in the seeds, through to, uh, to uh, renewable fuels. And I just want to make the point that I'm focusing on the fats and oil stream, which basically come from seeds, the oil that plants uh, accumulate in their seeds. Um, I don't need to labour this point, it's been covered yesterday and already again today. But uh, Australia has no problem with domestic food security. We use about a third of our land, one, 8 million hectares, to supply all the cereals, oil seeds, pulses, the grain legumes that we need uh, for our, our local population. We have another 17 million hectares of land, obviously not separately uh, located, um, that produces the same products essentially for the export market. So two thirds of our products go to the export market. And if you look at the oil seed section there, where it, we're through cotton seed and canola seed, we're exporting around you know, five or six uh, million tonnes of grain. It's going up because canola production is, is booming. Um, and within that grain, we have 2.5 uh, to 3 uh, million tonnes of oil that we're exporting that we could retain in Australia, and I think that we should retain in Australia to, to kickstart this industry. Um, what could I add to the discussions already? I think really that the reality here is that if we're going to do that, we have to be able to provide, or the renewable fuel industry has to be able to provide to the grower of those grains the same price or the same total benefit outcome, if you like, that they can get through selling that grain on the export market. There's no reason for a grower or a trader to sell you that feedstock for less than they can get in other markets. And so the challenge for the government is to to bring forward uh, a plan which bridges that gap, as Rachel and others have mentioned, such as an LCFS or, in the language of the current politics, a, bes a bespoke Australian system. Um, it has to achieve that outcome if we're going to uh, keep that feedstock in Australia and expand our production. So just building on that, that 17 million hectares, how much of that could we divert to oilseed crops? Now, Rachel's made the point that we have to intensify production wherever possible. We have to grow it without affecting um, our production of food because there's a global food security uh, imperative that we feed into. However, we now have a national fuel security imperative and we have an emissions imperative and I think we have to start to think about our sustainability goals, uh, elevating those into the equation. So I would say that food security locally is our first priority and I would actually elevate uh, fuel security and emissions reduction to the second level with our surplus being available to contribute to global food production. We only contribute about 2% about to global grain production. And this is happening in other countries. If you look at what's happening in the US and Canada, they are retaining soybean, crushing it, expanding it. Can Canada's doing the same with canola to start their renewable fuel industries. We have to be open for the discussion around social licence to do that in Australia because otherwise we'll be limited in how far we can go. And there ends my political statement. <laughs> um, I won't touch this at all because uh, Rachel's covered this very well about the, the cover crops that are in development and I need to really skip through to get to the, to the lead if you like, I don't want to bury it. Um, in, the, in the sense of how, many more, how much more oilseed crop production could we do, we have a lot of options in Australia of crops that have previously been grown. Uh, for oil production in different uh, regions and they can be uh, re-established if you like to provide uh, domestic oil sources and I've, I've listed there the three stars I think would be more canola as I just mentioned perhaps some higher russic juncia which is a relative canola that has the same 
has an oil composition which is not suitable for food, much the same as carinata. And so I think we should be looking at these options. I didn't get an advance then. Okay, the second, well, the, the, so the two points, grow more canola and then grow more oil, uh, bring back the surplus that we are exporting and then grow more canola. The third is the opportunity to increase, increase the intensity of oil production in our oil crops. Um, we Breeders have done a pretty good job of increasing oil content, but if you look at the biological limits, sesame has 60% oil and macadamia has 70% oil, so it's possible to go to very high levels in seeds. And uh, our oil seeds, by contrast, are in the 40%. This is not building. <laughs> I'm not getting an advance on the slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so there's a, some ground that could be made up there by um, developing versions of those oil seeds which have much higher oil contents that wasn't previously possible but I think is now possible with technology that's emerged in the last decade or so. And so I'm very optimistic that we could uh, increase the oil content of cottonseed for instance from 18 up to the, in the 40s um, and potentially also for Australia that we could develop lupins from a grain legume into an oil seed legume similar to soybean which doesn't perform very well in Australia under rain fed conditions. So that can contribute some further increase, but I think we actually need a step change. And if you want to innovate tomorrow, you have to start to invent yesterday, in fact, 10 years ago. And that's what we did in CSIRO. Just after the food fuel um, issues around 2008 and 9, we asked, is there another way to produce oil in agricultural systems than in the limited number of seed crops that we have. So if you look here, this is a, just a figure of the total amount of biomass in agriculture. That's in the green. It's something like 25 billion uh, metric tonnes, predominantly in grazing and forage crops or in cereal crops, uh, you know, 5 billion tonne there producing 2.5 billion tonnes of grain. And on the left, the oil crops. And the, the, the little square in yellow is the amount of oil we produce in agriculture. It's very small because of the limited number of sources and it's in balance with our food requirements. But we've got a different market now. So we asked, could we produce oil in a different way? And the question we posed was, could we make it in the leaves of plants and thereby produce it in any plant and across a much wider area? And some very smart scientists in my group, just down the other end of the lake at CSIRO, uh, actually achieved this in 2014. We took the genes from uh, seeds of plants, which are responsible for the synthesis of triglycerides and the accumulation of oils, and we expressed them in the leaves of a tobacco plant as a model plant, aiming to do the same, put the same pathway into leaves and get oil developed. And in fact, this is a very spectacular picture, um, shows it very clearly. The picture, these are actual cells of a tobacco leaf. The one on the left is a normal type. Plants store their energy as, as starch, basically, and the rest of the, the cell is effectively empty. When we introduced those genes, we produced uh, an oil factory in the leaf. And the first iteration of the technology, that was 15% on a dry weight basis. With some further modifications, we got that to 35%, which is the same density as in most of the oil seeds. So if you think about that, uh, it's a tremendous step change in productivity. If you compare it to the uh, crops, you know, the soybean crop is about, each bottle is about a tonne per hectare of oil. Soybeans less than half, sunflower more than half, canola about one tonne. That tobacco plant, uh, which can be about 20 tonnes of uh, dry weight per hectare when grown as a biomass crop, just at 25% oil would give you five tonnes of hectare, five tonnes of oil per hectare, which is equivalent to a palm oil yield. So there's uh, a great opportunity to, to go to high levels of productivity and with productivity improvement comes uh, that affects the affordability. If the oil cannot go into the food market and it's just going into a, a separate market, I think there's a great opportunity to lower the unit cost of that oil through this system. Um, tobacco can't be grown in Australia. It's a totally prohibited, cr prohibited crop, so there was no path really to introduce the, that uh, pilot technology into, into production. But the good story is that this technology works in any plant. It effectively operates in a plant cell which is pretty much ubiquitous biochemistry across the whole plant kingdom. So we, can, we would expect that we can do this in any plant. 
and CSI went on to demonstrate it in sugarcane and sorghum and even in potatoes. So a potato in both the leaves and in the tubers. In the tubers, it's a, it's a predictor that we could actually develop a sugar beet that is actually an oil beet, not for Australia, but for countries that do produce sugar beet. So really the challenge now is to work out what plants work best and what plants as platforms are best for our, our agriculture and internationally in other countries uh, for other production areas. And that's what's happening now. Um, the sorts of systems we could envisage the using here. Um, this is a, you, you probably won't be familiar with this, this is a, a dual purpose um, long season canola variety which would be gra grown for grazing during the, the cooler months and then for seed uh, at the end of the, at the end of the season. We would envisage that if you can graze that crop you could also cut it instead and take those leaves off the harvest of oil um, then use the residues. The residue could go into other RD processes if you like, could go back on farm, could go into animal feed. And you could do that a couple of times during the season. Then you uh, stop cutting it and you let it go through to its normal canopy and produce its normal seed crop. And this could apply in, in feed grains like feed wheats for instance as well. So there's a lot of opportunity to intensify the production within the food production system by doing that. Another opportunity is obviously in sugarcane, much higher biomass, um, and we would envisage uh, uh, producing an oil cane that predominantly produced oil in the sugar cane, oil in the cane instead of sugar. As an interim, it's probably going to be an intermediate between the two. Uh, a classically processed cane that produces a, a sugar extract and also, uh, by separation, uh, an oil extract from that and can go through into the multiple markets. So really starting to have a biorefinery approach. And so just to conclude, you know, this is, um, these are choices we can make, technology choices we can make to design our feedstock and our renewable fuel system. And I would say that, you know, being a, an optimist in this space, techno-optimist, um, we could build from retaining the ex exported tallow, retaining the exported canola, and cottonseed, expanding our brassica, canola and carinata and, and related crop production, uh, developing the oilseed lupin. We could build stepwise over the next uh, decade or so uh, to close to the uh, current maximum uh, SAF requirement at 50% uh, blend limit. And then further out as the leaf oil, biomass oil becomes mature and, and proven commercially, uh, really the sky is the limit in terms of production. Uh, and we could meet the full requirement when we go to 100% SAF in jet fuel. And I think importantly, we need to also uh, go into the, re the diesel replacement for automobiles. We tend to dismiss that as electrified, and it will be electrified, predominantly electrified, but it will be slow to electrify in Australia because of a range of reasons. There's active opposition, it's late start. The legacy fleet will go for a long time in, in uh, in automobiles for passenger movement and also for freight. And if we don't do anything about replacing those emissions, we have this massive amount of emissions 25 years out from 2050. And there's a time value in emission reduction in terms of climate change. The earlier you do it, the, the better you ameliorate the effects of climate change. So I would encourage us to think of that market as well. And that's probably all I have time for. So thanks for that. And perhaps we can follow up some of the issues in the questions. Firstly, I would like to thank by Energy Australia, Shahana and your team. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. What a pleasure to be here and to be part of Australia's transition to renewable energy. I'm Anne Grobler. I'm the Head of Communications and part of the Business Development Team at Microbiogen. Today, I will share how Microbiogen's technology, which is already transforming the global ethanol industry, can help Australia to achieve energy and food resilience. Microbiogen is a Sydney-based biotech with global success in improving the industrial capabilities of yeast. We deliver yeast innovation as a service to global industry leaders such as Novonesis 
and our co-developed ethanol products are the leading biocatalyst used for ethanol production in North America. Microbiogen is profitable. Last year we had a record operating margin of 50% and we expect that 2024 will be another record year for us as we continue expanding our portfolio of commercialized products. The secret of microbiogen success lies in the industry agnostic platform technology and the index library of elite yeast genetics that we have developed over the past 20 years. The yeast species we focus on is called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which you may know as brewer's or baker's yeast. This yeast is essentially the workhorse for industry and it underpins around $2 trillion in products per year. Yeast is an essential component in the large scale production of ethanol. It is used as an ingredient in animal feed and food. It is the active ingredient that makes bread rise. It's also widely used in pharma. For example, it's used for the production of insulin and also for semaglutide, which is sold as Zempic. At Microbiogen, we improve yeast to excel in its existing applications. We are also developing new yeast for emerging applications. Our technology can be leveraged to maximize the use of biomass sugars in the production of ethanol for ethanol to jet. As you all know, sustainable aviation fuel can be made from a large variety of feedstocks. A key, feed, key pathway to sustainable aviation fuel is ethanol. And the technologies, as you heard from Jimmy, yesterday the, um, the technology for the conversion of ethanol into jet fuel are rapidly maturing. As a result, the demand for ethanol is increasing, making it critically important to ensure that ethanol is produced as efficiently, as sustainably, and as economically as possible. And this is where microbiogen's technology comes in. We improve ethanol production maximizing the use of biomass sugars to produce ethanol as well as protein. Producing enough ethanol to meet the growing demand for SAF is a challenge. It is estimated that by 2050, we will need around 500 billion liters of jet fuel per year. Let's assume that all of this jet fuel will be made using ethanol as its main feedstock. And under this scenario, we would need to produce around 850 billion liters of ethanol per year. Today, we are only producing around 130 billion liters of ethanol per year. That means that by 2050, we will need to increase ethanol production seven times that of what it is today. How are we gonna make that much ethanol? So first generation ethanol, um, which is made using food sugars, edible sugars, and converting those into ethanol. It's a mature industry. It's what most of the ethanol is, um, how most of the ethanol is produced world worldwide. It's, it has a very well um, established infrastructure, but there are obviously the food versus fuel concerns. Then there's second generation ethanol production where non-food sugars are converted into ethanol, so it's more sustainable than first-gen ethanol production. The thing is, with second-gen ethanol, the technologies are still emerging and maturing, and it's generally more expensive than first-generation ethanol production. In Australia, we are well positioned to produce sustainable aviation fuel from sugarcane ethanol. Sugarcane has a very high biomass yield, and Half of this biomass is readily available sugars. It's also a very poor protein source, which makes it the ideal feedstock to produce ethanol. It also, sugarcane ethanol also has a very compelling CI score when you compare it to starch ethanol. And Australia has the luxury of looking at the global deployment of second generation ethanol facilities, such as in Brazil and in India. The waste and side streams from sugarcane ethanol production could be upgraded into protein, adding to the food supply and making the whole process more sustainable. It also provides ethanol producers with the opportunity to diversify their revenue streams. So from a practical perspective, what does this mean? 
In the following section, I will talk you through the benefits Microbiogen's technology provides to first-generation sugarcane ethanol plants, both from a revenue and from a sustainability perspective. This diagram represents an industry standard first-gen sugarcane ethanol plant. There are hundreds of these facilities around the world and they all function more or less in the same way. The key thing to note is that after ethanol distillation, the ethanol producer is left with a substantial amount of vinas waste that they need to dispose of. This vinas waste is typically transported and spread on the fields and this occurs at a cost. Microbiogen solution delivers three key benefits to first-gen sugarcane ethanol plants. Higher ethanol yield, less waste, and sustainable food or feed. Taking a closer look at that finesse shows that it contains a lot of carbon that is tied up in compounds that most yeasts can't use. Microbiogen has developed yeast that loves this stuff. It can grow on these carbon sources to produce high quality single cell protein. And it can also do that while producing very beneficial natural enzymes. And that is one of the secrets to making the whole process more sustainable. We also see this as an attractive opportunity for revenue diversification. We estimate that just by upgrading the Vanas waste stream, Using the yeast we've developed, a first-gen sugarcane ethanol plant can increase its revenue by over 30%. Next, let's look at the benefits our technology offers second-gen ethanol, sugarcane ethanol plants. In a, oh, it's not progressing. There we go. In a second-gen plant, shown on the schematic in the grey dotted line, the feedstock for ethanol production is non-food biomass waste, such as the bagasse that you're left with after extracting all the sugar juices from sugarcane. Most yeasts do not perform particularly well when they are provided with only biomass waste as their main feedstock. But we have developed yeast that love it. Essentially, it's a very similar story as for first-gen sugarcane ethanol plants, with three main benefits, high ethanol yield, less waste, and high quality, sustainable food or feed produced from the waste streams, and that provides the, off um, the opportunity for revenue diversification. Life cycle analysis showed significant ESG benefits when using our improved yeast versus conventional second generation ethanol yeast. For example, carbon dioxide levels are decreased or reduced by another 29%, while the whole process requires 75% less water and 240% less land. If you're interested in reading the full life cycle analysis, I've included a link at the bottom of this slide. Happy to send it to anyone that needs it. To wrap up, Microbiogen is already transforming the global biofuels industry. We have a seven year track record delivering innovative yeast solutions to ethanol plants around the world. Our yeasts help both first and second gen ethanol producers achieve higher ethanol yields. We are developing the best solutions for second gen ethanol plants. Our technology can be used to valorize waste streams to produce high quality protein for animal feed along with enzymes, etc. Lastly, our technology could assist Australia in meeting its sustainability objectives by achieving more with less. Thank you. Good morning all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, congratulations to Shahana and the team for yet again another fantastic conference. Um, so I'm David Wren, I'm with the Australian Sugar Milling Council. The ASMC is the peak body representing Australian sugar millers. You, you may have heard of companies like Wilma, Mackay Sugar, uh, Tully Sugar, Isis. Not the, um, not the, <laughs> not that, I know what you're thinking, but, but not them. Um, so in the, um, in the time I have, I just want to run through four themes. Um, revenue diversification is a priority for the Australian sugar industry, and I'll talk about how ASMC plays in that space as the peak body for the millers. 
I'll talk about how we're positioned to contribute to the agenda that we're all pursuing. I'll address some of the risks that uh, are confronting us and, and holding us back from making some, some big investments. And uh, I'll try to um, kind of give some impressions about what we would like to see to de-risk some investment decisions and um, really uh, utilise what we've got uh, as a sector to contribute to decarb, you know, fuel security and a diversification of the Australian sugar industry. So you might have heard of a document called Sugar Plus. It was a framework that the Australian sugar industry has pulled together over the last couple of years. It sets a blueprint for the Australian sugar industry to maintain its viability and sustainability going forward and, contrib and, and continue that vital contribution to, to regional New South Wales and regional Queensland. We've all probably driven through cane fields or seen a mill out in the paddock. There are 23 of them up and down the coast of, a, of the east coast of Australia, contributing over 20,000 jobs, producing $4 billion in gross state product. Um, and these are energy powerhouses, and we are not utilising that energy that these mills generate. And the discussions we're having today is really starting to peel the layers off in terms of utilising that capability. Um, so we work with our milling members and what we are seeing is obviously some market failure here. That's an economics term. In public policy parlance we call it a market failure. The conditions are not right for the market to respond to what we are seeing because there are too many risks. And we've heard about those risks over the last day or two and why we need public policy to de-risk some of these investments. So that's why we work really closely with our members. I understand kind of their thinking. They tell me what they're interested in, what their strategic objectives are, and they tell me and say, David, go and work with like-minded people and get those singular, coherent, cogent policies into state and federal government. So that's my, that's my job. So we evaluate uh, what sugar countries are doing overseas. And I can tell you Australia, we're not doing that well. So I think of Brazil is the behemoth in the, in the, in the global sugar industry. Uh, they generate 50% of their revenue is actually from raw sugar sales in the global market, 50%. We're at 85%. Thailand are also hedging, they're de-risking their industry. They're at 75% in terms of the amount of revenue they get from raw sugar sales. Now, why is that a problem? The raw sugar industry globally, we export, I should say, 90% of our raw sugar. It goes to mainly the Far East market, which is Asia. Uh, the global sugar industry is a very, very volatile market. It's uh, prone to subsidies to producing countries. It's prone to oversupply. It's prone to long ebbs in the price cycle. And for a fairly small uh, exporting looking uh, sector, that's a problem for us. You know, we, we have to withstand those long ebbs in that price cycle. So we need to hedge and we need to utilise this energy and diversify our revenue stream or we won't be around for, for too long, I can tell you that. So this discussion we're having today is critical to our ongoing commercial viability. So uh, what, um, what I want to do, and I get, this, I get this question a lot, is just talk through what our capability looks like. Now these are indicative numbers, so please don't go away and make some investment decisions <laughs> based on this data. But, but um, this is some work we've been doing with members around how, what, what's, what's, and we hear a lot about sugar's role in this bioeconomy space. So this work is trying to give some context to the narrative and to put our potential contribution into some kind of perspective. So. The gas liberalisation, you'll, you'll probably hear me say it a couple of times today, what does it actually mean? So the gas, as, as we've just heard, is that pulpy, fibrous material that is left after the cane is crushed and, and, the, and the juice is extracted through the process. It's also got a lot of good qualities. It's high in energy and the previous speaker talked about those good qualities. So we actually burn the gas in boilers to make steam and that steam is used in the factories 
to run auxiliary functions or it's sent into steam turbine generators to make electricity. That electricity goes back into the factory or it goes into the grid. Now, these factories are also 110 years old and they're kind of had renewals over, over the years and they're hanging together, but um, they burn the bagasse very inefficiently. So we're not getting maximum bang for buck out of our bagasse. But if we were to renew the factories, and a lot of these factories are up for renewal, and implement energy efficiencies into these factories, we could actually use less bagasse to create the energy or the steam that we need to run and do what we need to do. So we're introducing electrification and efficiencies into the factories and we're liberalising bagasse. We're freeing it up to do something else with it. So if we were to liberalise it, what do we do with it is the, is the $64,000 question and that's the work we're, we're, we're currently doing at the moment. Now, three levels of ambition. Scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. Scenario one is where we're electrifying, we're changing, we're tweaking the steam on cane settings in the factories and we're storing bagasse and we're using it differently. Right through to the Rolls-Royce, which is scenario three, is basically we're starting again. We're stripping the mills down, the factories down, we're replacing uh, the gasifying biomass, we're putting new gas turbines in, we're putting very, the world leading high pressure boilers into the system. So three levels of ambition and three levels of complexity and three levels of cost. Now, if we were to do that, how much bagasse can we liberalise? Scenario one, 1.4 million tonnes of bagasse is liberalised. I should say there's about 10 million tonnes now that we are burning, okay, through the system. As I say, if we renew and invest, how much liberalised to do something else with? Scenario two, 2.4 million tonnes. Scenario three, 4 million tonnes is liberalised to do something with. Now, Current key options for the sugar industry is to make more electrons, put it through steam turbine generators, you know, sell it into the grid and ride that wave of what is the national electricity market. That comes with a whole lot of cost and complexity and risk. But we could go from 440 megawatts to 680 megawatts, right through the Rolls Royce, 440 megawatts to 1.7 gigawatts of co-generator power. Very, very large energy player if we were to go down that path. Alternatively, if we didn't go the cogen route or and or went into eth uh, additional ethanol, we are making ethanol now out of molasses, which is first generation um, ethanol technology. We heard about 2G ethanol, second generation ethanol. We can use the bagasse, we can use tops and trash, the vanasse, uh, mill mud, uh, and we can use the juice we may decide as an industry to not make sugar anymore. We may just extract that juice, that sugar juice, and put it through a 2G ethanol plant. And obviously the economics of that have to be weighed up. But think for now, for these purposes, we're just using this liberalised bagasse. Forget juice, forget the molasses, forget everything else. This is just this option. 277 megalitres of ethanol to make 154 megalitres of jet fuel under scenario one right through to scenario three, 277 ml of ethanol to produce 703 ml of jet fuel. So we're not gonna satisfy all of Australia's needs and requirements, but it's a fair contribution. We, we can make a fair dent in, in, the, um, in the supply demand balance if we were as an industry to go down the, the biofuel route. So what's holding us back? It seems so simple. Uh, it seems like a linear relationship, we invest, we free up, we get an offtake and away we go. But it's, as people who know, who make these commercial decisions every day, it's not that easy. So what's holding us back? So the technology. So 2G ethanol, it's been trialled, um, it's at demo phase in India and Brazil. So we need to understand 2G ethanol and the use of lignocellulosic feedstock and sugar feedstocks into those processes. So we, we are monitoring and understanding that technology pathway. Um, there are obviously other pathways, technology pathways that the industry can utilise. We're, we're keen to understand, for example, hydrothermal. 
uh, liquefaction, which is the Lysellas technology that they've been working with the industry up in Mackay. So very keen to understand how we can utilise the tops and trash. So when you harvest the cane, tops and trash, the green leafy matter, we could, we could go down the oil route or we could just use it as a sugar variety and, and, and use that tops and trash. So that comes with complexities in terms of collecting, raking, harvesting, what is a very light leafy matter. So, um, and obviously there's a, there's a price gap there and we've all t we know about the price gap. Two to, two to three, four, five times more expensive and that breeds a whole lot of complexity from a commercial perspective and a policy perspective in terms of how do you get that price gap under control. And we've heard it ad nauseum today, we also support measures like regulated demand for biofuels. Uh, we, are, we are subject to uh, mandating Queensland for E10 for ethanol. They work most of the time, uh, but that's really the only way when you've got a market failure and a price gap that big, you've really got to compel uh, the supply and demand side to do the work. So we support a mandate for biofuels. Contracts for difference, there will be a gap in getting these things to a return that makes commercial sense, and we've seen our numbers. So a contract for difference that knocks the top off, gets that price gap under control, will be needed to reach a commercial rate of return. I should say the industry too is just not a feedstock supplier. We are a potential producer here as well. So we may opt as an industry to fully integrate. We may produce the feedstock, collect the feedstock, build the 2G ethanol and maybe even go into the SAF route. So we're still working that out you know, with members uh, 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 you know, as, as, the, um, as the situation evolves. So going forward, thanks Georgie, um, we would like to see some alignment and that's been the theme of the last day and a bit, alignment between state and federal governments to deliver a comprehensive, cogent set of policy supply and demand that incentivise the market to get on with it and make some decisions. We would like the state government to get into R&D and technology, pr proving up the technologies. You know, there's demos and pilots that need to be worked through. So there's a role there for government and the, and the private sector to work together. What we will do as mills is to con continue to evaluate the commerciality of these options, reconcile that with the policy environment and hopefully pursue the objectives which is to revenue diversify and ensure the long term viability of the Australian sugar industry. So thanks very much. Happy to take any questions. <laughs>
Um, so if we were to withdraw a part of that uh, to satisfy our fuel security needs, particularly in the early stages before we get all the pathways up and running and some of the technology that I spoke about building in a really intensified way rather than um, taking land away from food, I think that we can change that. But it does need the discussion to happen very broadly because I think it can, uh, you know, an in implied consensus can easily break apart if you haven't brought people along with you. It's consumers, it's the agricultural sector, it's policy makers, it's, it's developing that narrative to the community that this is a really important thing we need to do, not just in Australia but globally, and that other players are moving down that path. Let's not constrain our options. I think for us we're seeing it developing as food and fuel. Um, when we talk about some of the things that have been on the panel today, if you bring crushing onshore to Australia, you know, 45% is oil, and the meal is a valuable animal nutrition product that goes into the, the animal feed sector. Um, so we're starting to see the, the debate change to something that's uh, less emotional and more logical, and you know, we're, we're really excited about the way that's moving forward. Building on that logic, the reality is through technology, we can also make farmers more productive. And I think there's a good example in the Australian canola industry today uh, versus a decade ago today, growers produce 30% more. They're 30% more productive through breeding technologies and crop management practices. So there's a significant opportunity through ag technologies to make our growers uh, more productive. So producing more with less, essentially. And, you know, the example of Carinata, which could be grown between a, a cotton crop and isn't displacing a food crop. There are opportunities to explore with all the different technologies that exist in uh, plant science to produce more with less, essentially, and uh, contribute positively to that discussion. And I was going to uh, direct one to you, actually, Rachel. I, I thought that the uh, pivoting Carinata towards possibly cotton uh, was a good way to avoid that food versus fuel uh, debate, but do you do you see scope for Carinata as a cover crop between food rotations in Australia? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent question and something we're doing a lot of work on. So we're really trying to understand the right fit for Carinata within the agricultural system in Australia and within crop rotations. And there's a tonne of work all over the country happening to, to understand that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we know Carinata actually grows. So it, it grows in... Um, more marginal country than canola. It can extend for far for further north than canola can, as an example. So just to give a very small example, we've had a potato farmer in South Australia approach us because they believe that it could be a good rotational crop for them to plant in between their potato crop and solve some disease and soil health challenges they have. So I think it makes sense for us today to start in cotton because we see a very logical fit, uh, but there'll be other opportunities as emerge as we understand more about where, uh, where we can place it um, to help, again, solve grower challenges and give them a financial benefit because there has to be a clear value proposition for the Australian ag industry, otherwise they're not going to participate. Thanks. Questions from the... Oh, there we go, there's one up there. Oh, sorry. One here first. Yep. We'll get to you. Yeah. Is that on? Oh, yeah. So, Abby Hayward from um, Lend Lease. I just wanted to ask around, um, we've talked about food and fuel, obviously very critical, but the um, potential conflict with biodiversity. So, whilst we're in a carbon crisis and this is all very critical to reduce our emissions, we're also in a biodiversity crisis. So, um, Jeff touched on it with your rain, uh, waterfall diagram with land use change land use change. So how do we make sure that um, with land use change being the biggest threat to Australian biodiversity, how do we make sure that we protect that whilst we also um, develop these crops for fuels? Yeah, i touch a little bit on, on what we spoke before. I, I think there's two things. It's getting more out of the land we've got and with some of these new novel crops and we saw a range of them th through the presentation. How do we move into the more marginal land? How do we move into um, land that, that has been you know, salt affected in the past? Can we bring that back? 
Um, so that will help us not have to move into um, land clearing and those type of issues. I should say also, if we look at the, the North American models, th there is severe penalties for feedstocks that do that. So there's not, a, there's not an advantage to trying to do that anyway, despite the, the, the biodiversity issue, which we absolutely want to make sure we, we get right. Um, there's, not, um, there's not an economic benefit to, to have to do that anyway. And I think that's, that's a safeguard for, for the environment and the industry. I can give a specific example in Western Australian canola where through breeding we've actually been able to increase canola in a grower's rotation in some of the marginal areas. So we've been able to increase canola in the rotation from one in five to one in three. That lamb would have been fallow before because we've been able to breed shorter season, more reliable varieties that help them get a result uh, despite the, the, um, the, the challenges and vagaries of the weather. So there's an example where we're able to increase production on existing land. I'll just add to that um, on the biodiversity front. So CSIRO is looking at this very closely. We're already starting to see other countries around the world purchasing farming land in Australia to grow sustainable aviation fuel uh, crops that don't necessarily have Australia's best interests um, at heart. And so we're looking at developing an assessment tool that can help us understand Australia's bioresources with a bit more nuance and to make these decisions about what is grown on these lands in the best interest for Australia's sustainability, uh, biodiversity, as well as, as, well as economic um, growth. So it's certainly something that we're very keen to, to tackle at CSIRO. Question up there. Uh, yes, Scott Grierson from Valorify. Question for you, Alan. Uh, firstly, want to um, pay respects to you and your career and the work that you've done. It's really inspiring for me, and uh, and I think uh, you, you've really laid out a, a very cockeyed optimist's view of the world, and I tend to share that vision. But I have a question for you because I've, I've dabbled in, in algae and seaweeds in the past, and what I see in that particular plant uh, sort of family is that if, a, if an organism is actually channeling a lot of its photosynthetic in energy into storage, then by definition it's not growing very fast. So how does that play to, to that technology and that approach that you're advocating for, for lipid storage and accumulation in a variety of different crops, and how does that impact on food production and, and that metabolic pathway? Sure, it's a, it's a great question, Scott. Um, and you're right. Uh, it turns out it, it, um, it relies on how you deploy the trait in the plant. If you deploy the trait so that it's expressed very early in the plant, then it's taking energy that it's harvested through photosynthesis and carbon from carbon dioxide and it's putting it in storage instead of into canopy development, if you like. So the trick is really when to turn the genes on in plant development so that you get normal biomass development and then conversion of, of the uh, carbon that's stored in the, in the leaves into, into oil. Um, and we saw within the CSIRO program that we, there were additional things we could do that were overcoming um, that through the strategy of how you engineer the plant. So I'm very optimistic that, uh, that, tho that those questions probably need to be solved on a species by species basis because plants have the same general metabolism but they have different anatomies and different growth patterns, etc. So yeah, I th I th I'm optimistic about that as well. And, and thanks, thanks for your remarks, very nice. Thanks, um, it's Dennis from Wildfire. Um, recognising that all feedstocks have a place, um, isn't MSW and, and landfill waste going to be the, the cheapest feedstock to begin with, even though it's the most difficult to process, maybe for Max? Uh, yeah, so plenty of pros and cons for MSW and many are looking at it um, in Australia as well. Um, we've seen cases um, overseas, I think it's the social licensing aspect that's going to be really difficult for that um, technology pathway. These plants are going to have to be placed probably in urban areas and when you start to factor in NIMBYism it gets really difficult at the local level to get approval for these plants. We've seen a case of a waste to energy place uh, near Sydney that was um, cancelled due to local opposition and we've seen um, places like Fulcrum Energy in, um, in the US struggle to get this up from a social licensing point of view. So 
we certainly see it as a, as a logical um, input, but it's going to take a lot more narrative building to get people on board with that. And additionally, some other kind of economic issues that come with that is how councils are set up. Brisbane's really great for MSW collection. Brisbane covers about 1.2 million people in one mega council. And so it's really one person you're dealing with in an offtake agreement. But if you're to open a plant like this in Melbourne, you're probably going to have to have separate negotiations with 10 different councils, which really adds to the complexity of that kind of feedstock supply assurance. So I think um, economically it's certainly um, attractive, but there's a, there's a few other challenges that we need to overcome. Um, Jennifer Lauber Patterson, Frontier Impact Group. Methcansis is um, um, seen as a really um, high energy content energy crop around the world and is used in the US and UK and even growing in places like New Zealand. Um, I just wonder, Max, whether we've looked at Methcansis as a potential another opportunity as a biomass um, crop and you know, how can we put it on the agenda if we haven't already done so? Um, and if anyone else would like to comment, um, we'd be welcomed as well. Yeah, so just quickly, we covered it from a qualitative point of view. We didn't have enough available data to, to model what that, um, what the potential from Kansas might be in Australia. Um, and for our modelling exercises, we really did stick to those feedstocks that did have some commercial quantity or, or government plans aligned with expanding production, such as hydrogen. Um, and that is certainly something that we recommend in the report is a bit closer look at what Australia's potential is there. I think, um, you know, in terms of the, the appropriate latitudes for that um, really needs to be worked out in an Australian context, which doesn't appear to be too much research yet about what that opportunity might look like, but certainly I think one that we'll be hearing a, a bit more about over the coming years. Uh, g'day, Anthony Van Wyden from CSIRO. Um, just picking up on Joe's point, the food for fuel, um, under the European uh, Red Directive 30 duration, which will come into place in 2030, um, uh, Australian, well, about 40 to 50 per cent of Australia's canola crop is not going to have uh, anywhere to go because that will now, or at, from that time, will be deemed to be a high risk indirect land use change. Um, so. Farmers will either have to find another crop to grow or that canola will have to find uh, another home. I'm just interested to hear how the panel think that that might play out. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a couple of elements to that. As we spoke earlier, that um, very principled approach by the EU has perhaps um, had some indirect ramifications. Um, by capping uh, crop oils in the EU, they've pivoted to uh, use cooking oil. Um, some of that use cooking oil, uh, it's quite well discussed in last year about the traceability and the validity of that. Um, I think that's something the EU is going to have to address. Um, but we also see it as a, a, a great opportunity for an Australian SAF value chain. Um, you know, it gives, uh, it gives a risk management element to Australian farmers if we can uh, use it as a feedstock in an Australian SAF or RD value chain. If we can um, crush it onshore, uh, that gets um, risk management for our Australian farmers as well as um, you know, building an industry here. Um, I'd say also the EU approach is very different to the US and Canadian approach, so I think we've got to be careful. EU is one uh, system, it's not necessarily the leading system. Um, but I, I think you know that's the opportunity for Australia in terms of developing uh, an industry here and de-risking that for Australia and its its farmers as well as fuel security and things we've spoken about over the last couple of days. I can probably add something to that. I th I think um, it does go to how do we deploy different sources of renewable diesel that are made from different feedstocks. I think um, anything that we use within Australia for to replace domestic fuel, obviously, in like road transportation, uh, that doesn't have any impact because that only controls what they buy, what they're prepared to buy in those end markets. We're at liberty to deploy our, our products and our, our fuels however we like internally. Uh, we will have internal considerations about indirect land use change. No, don't get me wrong, but 
it's, it's our destiny to create. I think if we were to take um, some of the seed oil fuel, um, uh, feedstocks through to aviation fuels, that would be fine in the domestic market, but there would be flow-on effects in terms of um, uh, flights leaving Australia um, and going to those territories may be, um, may be uh, not allowed to fly with that feedstock, I don't know. So if you're looking for a unified single, fee, a single fuel in Australia that can refuel domestic flights and international flights, uh, that would become a, a confounding factor and a consideration. Uh, I don't know that you could segregate a domestic aviation fuel supply from an international one, uh, certainly not at our major uh, airports. Um, but yeah, I, I think we have the ability to design how we use it internally. If we were going for renewable diesel for the uh, automobile fleet uh, already, then there'd be a ready market straight away internally. Uh, David, question for you from, from me actually. So you mentioned revenue diversification is a major priority for the Australian Sugar Milling Council. Are farmers totally aligned with you? on that. I mean, recently it looks like my, my Googling powers have told me that the sugar price has been at fairly high levels. Um, is, is that tempering expectations or, or the priority to diversify both from Miller's and farmer perspective? I don't think so, Joe. Uh, I think anyone who's been in the industry for a period of time knows what we're seeing now will be very temporary. Um, the Confluence of factors that are creating $700 a tonne raw sugar prices at the moment are very unique. Uh, it's a combination of policy and seasonal factors um, and uh, a bit of post-COVID kind of recovery in terms of you know demand for sugar. So we know they won't last. Um, what's interesting is our sector has um, is absorbing under these high prices a very high amount of cost inflation in our production, not only on the farm, but also with the mills. Um, we, are, we have seen a 20% increase in costs over the last three years. Um, that is pushing us up the cost curve relative to our competitors. Uh, and I can tell you when the market goes back into equilibrium, um, I can tell you the discussions around revenue diversification will, if, but they're happening now, but that will only focus the industry further. Noted. And uh, probably a question on behalf of our two sort of uh, ethanol focused uh, panel members to you, Rachel. Um, you know, you talked about Carinata uh, and your plans in that sort of sector. Have you got anything for our um, alcohol to jet and Fisher Tropes tragics uh, from a cane perspective? We may. Um, it, it's still very early in Australia, but we, we did make an acquisition uh, in Brazil of uh, an energy cane program. And so essentially it's a, it's a sugar cane with one and a half times the biomass of traditional sugar cane. And that's um, the technology is scaling in Brazil and we'll explore the opportunities in the Australian market. So perhaps David and I can have a chat a little bit later. Uh, one up the back there. Um, hi, it's Kath Carney here from Department of Primary Industries in Forest Carbon Research. Um, just wanted to make a point about the biodiversity that's been raised yesterday and today a little bit. Um, we've done a large amount of research in woody crop trials. It's not something that's been mentioned very much here as a biomass opportunity. And those crop trials using native species, eucalypts, fast-growing eucalypts and mallees and acacias, and um, you know that has a biodiversity benefit as well as a soil improvement benefit. Um, so they are short rotation crop trials, uh, coppicing the materials so the roots stay in the ground. And I just thought I might mention that. And it's also included in our Biosmart tool. Um, thanks. Anything from the, the panel on that one? Yeah, I just want to echo the, the potential value of the, especially the oil mallies. So we considered them, again, from a qualitative point of view in our report and kind of outlined some of the, the benefits that you just mentioned there, especially through a coppicing technique, which leaves those roots in there and you can re, re harvest them. And it's also another way for our farmers to diversify some of their revenue streams. You can have that on the edges of your wheat crops, for example, or um, a bit more thoroughly throughout. So just want to echo those comments um, that that is another, yet another potential feedstock option for Australia. 
Question uh, to the panel from, from me. Uh, from a selfish perspective, look, feedstock risk, uh, both volume and price, is going to be a key, a key factor that, that any investor looks at. Uh, one element to, to help mitigate that risk is vertical integration, so, uh, and also having uh, an alignment of interests with maybe a feedstock supplier uh, being sort of within the, the project itself. Um, what are your thoughts on that as a panel, and <laughs> Jeff specifically? Uh, how might this relate to your uh, announcement with IFM? Yeah, so for GrainCorp, uh, when we think about agri-energy, we're the agri part of it. Um, our core skill is in uh, feedstock accumulation. Um, we certainly see the value of integration. So, um, you know, IFM ha bring skills that GrainCorp don't have. They're also skills that are complementary, uh, not competitive, so that's important. Um, and so that's a way to come together. We're not looking to go down the value chain and start uh, producing SAF or RD. That's not a core skill for us. Um, but it needs to be, uh, if we're de developing a new industry, it needs to be partnership, not just transactional. So we're, we're looking at that. Um, and I think there's an opportunity then to uh, have those players in the value chain partnering up to do what they do well with other partners. So supply agreement, no equity ticket. Sorry? Supply agreement, no equity ticket. <laughs> Jennifer Lauber, Patterson Frontier Impact Group. Just building on the um, discussions around oil mallee plantations, which I think um, would provide so much um, benefit um, the challenge that will come is if um, canola oil um, and those options do become available, they might be more cost effective. However, your oil mallee could potentially have other value added outcomes. Is there a potential in the way we design policy is to provide some type of premium for projects like oil mallee plantations that can provide a lot of value add um, but a premium so that those types of projects do um, are able to be commercialised as well. Just a, a thought. Yeah, potentially. And I think a lot of the oil mallee plantations that have occurred in the past um, didn't really come to fruition in terms of what a lot of farmers were promised in what was going to be, um, you know, bought in terms of the, the oil mallees that they did grow. And so I think there is a bit of hesitation about... Um, you know, taking on that as a crop again. So I think it might require a bit more of a well-packaged economic case for why farmers should be growing that on their farm. You know, there's a lot of other kind of sustainability benefits that come with it, whether it's um, protection from wind or soil retention. And I don't think these are currently well sold in terms of the economic case and the additional benefits that brings to your other crops. So I'm not sure whether it's a policy thing. Um, I won't be commenting on policy, but I think there's a better way to build that business case and, and properly quantify the benefits that go along with it, with that diversification. Down the front. Uh, hi, Catherine O'Sullivan from CSIRO. Um, kind of a, a related question, but directed at Jeff. Um, has Grain Corp thought about the logistics and aggregation of some of these other, perhaps more problematic um, feedstocks like the, the woody biomass crops or some of the agricultural residues and how we might start to address some of those logistics issues? Um, yeah, it's something we're starting to, to look at. So um, we've done some work on novel crops as well. Uh, Australia obviously is a large country with, with different agronomic uh, elements from north to south. Um, so we've had a look uh, at what can be done in the broadacre cropping area. Um, I, I think, as Rachel alluded to, the brassica is, is one of the key elements. It's pretty much the, the base crop. Uh, it comes from uh, Ethiopian mustard seed. That's how there's an ability to potentially um, put it into marginal land. But we've drawn a line at how to economically then get it to market. Um, It'd be fantastic to be able to grow something in the Simpson Desert, but how do you get that then economically to market? So we've drawn uh, the line at how we can utilise our existing supply chains and probably extend them a little bit to get product to market. Um, and we're trying to um, 
solve for today and tomorrow. So there's a lot of great work going on about what, um, what the future could look like. Um, for us, it's trying to solve for today and how we can extend uh, that infrastructure and our capability that's there for today. Excellent. Uh, one for, for Anne. Um, you know, noting the sort of up to 30% uplift that uh, it looks like you can achieve with first-gen bioethanol um, facilities with, with microbiogenes technology, what's the engagement been like with current ethanol producers and, and how does that compare to discussions or potential discussions you may have had with sort of second-gen alcohol to jet? <laughs> um, thank you for your question. Well, so uh, as I mentioned briefly, so we, our technology is already used in first-gen ethanol facilities all over the world. So it's um, predominantly in the US, which is the world's largest ethanol market. Um, there's a lot of interest. I can't give you all the, all the names of um, <laughs> the, the places like? that have been approaching us, but yes, there's been a lot of interest as well as in the second-gen um, options that we can provide. So it's, it's going well for microbiogen. <laughs> yeah. And, and are you getting interest on the Australian front as well? Unfortunately, that is where we really, really, really would love to roll out. So being an Australian company, um, having our products rolled out in Australia would be really close to our heart. So we would absolutely love to see um, our products deployed in Australia as well. There you go, David. <laughs> Anything more from the audience? If that's it, I think. Oh, one down the front, sorry. I can just shout it out for you. Uh, this one's for Max. Um, I know that the sort of the fourth um, part of one of your slides said that there's opportunities for industry collaboration with the CSIRO. Um, what do you see sort of as in the, in the next three years the biggest opportunities um, for collaboration that will be to the benefit of all the different ag pathways to biofuels? That's a great question and you know so we kind of we have business units in manufacturing we have we do energy we do agricultural so we've got Catherine here as well um, the biggest ones I think is really looking at what the emerging technologies are. So things like HEFA, it's been around for 10 to 15 years. Um, we've got plenty of very accomplished commercial operators who are looking at that problem. So we definitely see that um, off and away. So how can we help these more kind of next generation emerging technologies, be it power to liquids, which needs a lot more um, R&D challenges overcome in terms of how that's integrated. There are no large scale plants of that nature at the moment. So that's a big focus for, for some of our groups and, and looking at these next generation um, seeds and, and crops, such as the ones that Alan mentioned, so that the leave oil work, how can we, how can we look at the, what's going to be used in 10 to 15 years time and let, let business um, concentrate on you know, what's, what's happening in the next kind of five to 10 years. But um, yeah, couldn't pick a top one, um, but yeah, suffice to say there are plenty. Excellent. Um, if that's it, we might wrap up five minutes early, um, if that's okay. Uh, another round of applause for our panel. Thanks, guys.